Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's uh, event. I'm Steve Conroy. I'm the faculty director for the Center for Peace and Commerce here at the University of San Diego. And before we get started with today's event, which I know you're all looking forward to, as am I, uh, there are several organizations on campus that have been working very hard to bring you today's speaker. And I want to mention those uh, right away in alphabetical order. Um, the Allers Center for International Business, who provided lun lunch for you today. The Center for Peace and Commerce. The Latin American Studies Program. The Office of International Constituent Relations. The Office of the Provost. The Transborder Institute. And Comité Mexico. While Mexican soccer fans, Latin American bread lovers, and students of ethical business may have heard of Grupo Bimbo, I'd like to say a few words about the company before I introduce today's speaker. Uh, Grupo Bimbo is the largest producer of bread products in Mexico, Latin America, the United States, and indeed the world. Uh, they had $8.9 billion in reported sales during 2009. That went up to $9.2 billion in 2010 and $10.7 billion in uh, 2011. Um, they um, are a very profitable business. They've expanded dramatically, as we'll talk about later. Their uh, growth has been largely through acquisition, uh, especially in re recent years, although they started out uh, with a more organic uh, growth model. Um, it's an honor to bring someone of this stature to our campus and to this stage today. Don Roberto Servite Sendra, co-founder and now chairman of the board of Grupo Bimbo, was with the company in 1945 when it began a new chapter after being essentially a mom and pop bakery. What he and the other co-founders did was nothing short of amazing. As they moved from a very localized bakery model to what we have today in most parts of the world sliced bagged bread that has a much longer shelf life, allowing for a much larger distribution channel. In fact, in Mexico, pan bimbo is synonymous with sliced bread. It's um, purchased from a grocery store regardless of the brand, just as we may use Band-Aid to refer to a sterile disposable bandage. In Mexico, they often refer to this kind of bread as pan bimbo. Over time, Pan Bimbo grew throughout Mexico, Latin America, and is now one of the largest, if not the largest, it is the largest bread manufacturer in the U.S. They own such brands as Bimbo, Oro Wheat, Sara Lee, Wonder, Thomas, English Muffins, a favorite of mine, and, <laughs> and many others. What has lasted and even evolved over time at Grupo Bimbo is a philosophy that is about treating workers customers, and all stakeholders, in fact, in an ethical fashion. There does not exist an antagonistic or adversarial relationship between management and employees. In fact, quite the opposite. To my knowledge, they've never had a strike in their more than 65 years of business. And they are one of the largest, most profitable businesses in the world today, as I will discuss later. This high ethical standard has recently been recognized, particularly Don Roberto's role in it, as he was awarded the 2010 Oslo Business for Peace Award. And this is just one of many that he and Grupo Bimbo have won over the years. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Don Roberto Savite Sendra, chairman of Grupo Bimbo. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm honored to have been invited to speak with you this afternoon. When they sent me the invitation, I told them that I, if, if there was the possibility to do it in Spanish, because I don't trust very much my English. <laughs> Fortunately, they say yes. And let, let me tell you why this happened. A few years ago, I was invited to, to give a lecture at the University of McGill in Montreal, and I gave my lecture in English. They, they filmed it, and when they sent me the cup, they said, no, I will never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you are going to excuse me, and I'll do it in Spanish, and I'm sure that Yolanda is going to do a much better job than myself in English. 
Well, the, the title of this presentation is how to make or have a truly efficient and humane company. I greatly appreciate the invitation that was extended me to participate as a speaker uh, on this momentous occasion. I congratulate the University of San Diego for organizing this kind of event which promote and foster values of great importance. It is an honor for me particularly that, well, in addition to being quite pleased at being here, uh, that I have been afforded the opportunity to express certain concerns which I am sure those of us here share. I have been asked basically to touch upon two subjects with you, how a traditional company may or can innovate, and that which has to do with the individual's profit, social responsibility, especially insofar as uh, taking care of our planet and social peace. As to the first topic, innovation, I believe that a company and the way in which it manages itself needs to be transformed, not only in economic terms, but even more so in social aspects. The economic transformation, as we know, should translate into companies, be they small, mid, or large, that they be ever more efficient, that they produce their goods and services efficiently to the service of the society at large, and that they incorporate added value so as to increase the wages or monies due to its stakeholders. One must work with excellence, one must work efficiently, one must be modern technologically speaking, must continuously improve productivity, and must seek to eliminate bureaucracy, this being somewhat difficult, especially in larger companies. When I referred to an incessant search for improving productivity, I am firmly convinced that this is the only way in which a company can advance uh, and continue. I'm also firmly convinced that a company that is not working on innovation, on transformation, and constantly improving productivity is a company that has no future and which eventually will disappear. Innovation insofar as social aspects, which in my view are even more significant. This because it has to do specifically with a more uh, humanistic aspect, with which is directly related to human beings, which of course has to do with one's clients, with one's consumers, with one's suppliers governments, and really society which surrounds the company, but even more specifically directly related to the people working at a given company. This social transformation uh, takes many forms. The focal point, the truly transcendental issue has to do with the concept that the company has of people themselves, how they look at and how they treat their clients, how they look at and how they treat their consumers, how they look at and treat their suppliers, how they look at and treat the community which they find themselves in and how they look at and ultimately treat their employees. 
if we speak of innovating under Christian criteria, that is to say, to ensure the issues of justice, respecting an individual's dignity, solidarity, the value of work, there are many things then that need to be changed. Our modern companies have made significant strides in this area, especially as compared to uh, the companies of yore, but we still have much to do. Unfortunately, there are still those companies who remain silent, who sell uh, products or services that don't work, where there are elevated prices, and something very, very negative and unfortunately widespread is while they may not mistreat their employees per se, they do use them as opposed to integrating them into these processes. And this specifically is one, uh, an area that poses uh, both a significant opportunity as a challenge. Uh, businesses and companies may not yet have come to understand that the most important thing in a company is not represented by the profits, the equipment, nor even by technology. More important than any of this is the human being. And if one understands this and attends to this, then everything else, as uh, we've heard, comes naturally. I think that the companies that don't believe in this have no future, even though it may appear that they're doing well and they might last for quite a long while, they will not uh, continue on and on. There are different constituencies which a company needs to keep in mind. It must be profitable to satisfy financial goals. It must be responsible in terms of individuals, individuals of all type, whether these be clients, as I mentioned, consumers, suppliers, the competition, and of course, the company employees. I've been asked to chat with you a bit about Bimbo, its values, and its principles. To better understand the church's um, social doctrines, we understand that the church has significant responsibility to these various constituencies. In our group, we follow a guiding principle. We've said for a great many years now that we want to be a highly productive company, but one that is uh, fully human. I must say, honestly, that these goals have not been fully achieved by us yet, but we are profoundly um, pleased to see the progress that we've made in these areas. We refer to the productivity so that we can satisfy the needs of our partners and our investors to modernize, to pay the taxes which we're responsible for, and to support social causes. And we want to be a company that fully considers uh, human beings in the sense that we're responsible to our clients, our consumers, our suppliers, and that our staff at all levels have a workplace filled with brotherhood, a workplace that is such that not only are one's economic needs met, but also one's dreams. As a group, we want individuals within the company to find the environment that will allow them to reach their full potential as human beings. We know and we understand that all of us have dreams and hopes, desires to participate, desires to belong, to leave uh, a legacy behind in our life and that the of the many people who work around the world 
one will either achieve one's, one's dreams or become frustrated, and this is greatly dependent upon one's workplace. I'd like to speak a bit more regarding the concepts which we follow at the group in order to truly be a company that has a soul that's focused on uh, individuals as human beings. A great many years back, we said that employees must be treated with justice, with respect, with trust, with affection. We understood later that these good wishes would only become a reality if those in management felt these values to be their own. And we then thought that the company was going to be what its people thought, and its people were going to think what its management thought. So we are convinced that a company will be or is what its people are, and its people will or be or are what its management staff is. And this is a reality if we have dreams of being a company that recognizes individuals as human beings and we try to apply all the principles and values which exist. But if this principle, which I refer to, our management does not understand, does not encompass, does not espouse, we're not going to achieve what we're looking for. So this concept then uh, leads into the tremendous care and attention given to selecting those who will be in a management roles. Uh, recruitment or selection is fundamental to everything else, but it is also um, Another thing which is also invaluable is ongoing training, and training is, is an activity which really never ceases. Staff who understands, who accepts, who participates in this kind of value does so when they are fully integrated into our operation, when they're trained, when their opinions are taken into account, when they are somewhat participative. I believe uh, fundamentally that this is necessary for the kind of company we wish to create. This kind of participation, this type of of involvement isn't easily achieved. It requires time. It re requires constancy. It requires uh, truth and authenticity. It does, as I mentioned, require that management really truly live and feel this to make it a reality. We f w want management, whether they like it or not, where they, whether they realize it or not, are role models. And as such, they play a tremendously important role. As I mentioned, training is invaluable in all of this. Many types of courses are required from those that are purely operational to those that have to do more with the individual, individual goals, individual growth, family life, etc. This, although it might appear to be trivial, is a cornerstone towards an individual understanding that they are not a silent bystander, but rather an enthusiastic participant and one who is proud of the company that they work for. This, I just said, might appear to be trivial, but if I were pressured to say so, I would say that a company success is due or exists thanks to its employees, not management, employees who, with their enthusiasm, their flexibility, their desire to really be effective at work. They're the ones who allow us to move forward. And we 
really want our employees to feel involved, to feel themselves a part of the company, not a silent uh, bystander, an active participant. And when you achieve this, when you're really able to um, wear the, 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 the logo or the brand well, the T-shirt, that's when you do so. And, 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 and you can even feel the degrees of emotion which exist once that happens. Um, at one point, there was a salesman who, after having worked 30 or 40 years in the company um, at Marinela, the company that sells the uh, pastries that we make, was uh, retired at 65. Several years after that, his wife appeared at the company and said she wanted to ask a favor, that if she, they could give her a Marinella salesman's uniform. And they said, of course, but why? And she said, because she was, at, she said, because he asked to be buried in the uniform of a Marinella salesperson. So that's what I mean. It's to that extent that people are involved or feel committed to the company. With the passage of time, we found that while we while we were a company with positive values, we didn't fully uh, encompass uh, total quality. We were doing well, but we hadn't understood really the full concept of working with excellence, it's sort of Mexican style, like we sang badly, but at least we sang loudly, right? <laughs> to understand the importance of operating with total quality and doing everything which was required was a very important step which helped us consolidate our efforts to become a fully socially responsible company. To operate with total quality is additionally a measure of respect for our consumers, for our employees, and for society at large. I could go on and on about many things which have helped us achieve our ideals, which, as we know, can't be attained to perfection, but where we do know that progress can be made and where we can be pleased with it. Several years ago, I was at a conference of young entrepreneurs, one of whom asked me, how, how can you ensure that a company that places the importance on the individual as a human being can also be a profitable one? And I responded that that was a very important question because that's the false dilemma which many entrepreneurs face. They they think that to place importance on the human uh, or on the individual means not being profitable. So, you know, their thoughts are, do you want the country club or do you want results? But I don't, I said, I'm going to answer your question with another question. How can you have a profitable company if you don't place the importance on the individual as a human being. This kind of company is more likely to be efficient, creative, uh, have flexibility to face the changes which are so accelerated in our modern era. An example uh, of what can be done when this kind of environment exists is the following. Several years uh, back, and uh, fast approaching an anniversary of mine, I thought that our retirement age in the company no longer really coincided with the times that we were living in. Our collective work agreements with the various unions and with staff, non-union as well, required that people retire when they turn 60. I thought that today, when life span expectations are 
far greater that to retire at 60 years was rather negative for a company that would then lose someone with tremendous experience, terrible, that it would be a terrible uh, blow for the individual, for the society at large, and for the wife of the employee who would then be retired as well. It wouldn't go so well for her. I thought that it, for all, it would probably be a better idea to increase the retirement age. I spoke to my close uh, staff first, and then I discussed it with the general secretary of the largest union we had back then, a state senator in Mexico. He said to give him a couple of weeks to review the issue. Back then, 1995, more or less, we had 46,000 uh, employees. It did not appear to be easy. There were many interests at stake. However, within a two-week period, he called me back and he said, let's move forward with the change, uh, except for a few, case, a few individual cases. And we were able to make that change to the retirement age. We were able to do so because people knew that we weren't lying to them. They knew we were being open with them. Currently, 67 plus is our retirement age, and it has been increased as life expectancy increases as well worldwide. It's important to understand this. I In Roosevelt's uh, era, I believe lifespan expectations 62 in the US. So retirement was at 60, two years that the government had to take care of these individuals. But today it's 20 years, not two. And there isn't, the resources really aren't there financially speaking. So this is important. Recently in France, they tried to increase the retirement age from 60 to 62 years of age. They weren't able to do so. There were wounded, there were uh, out, uh, riots, fires, deaths. Why? There wasn't that open environment. This being something so wonderful for the individual and for the society, if the environment which exists in a particular arena isn't conducive to that, it doesn't move forward. Uh, I saw that a highly productive company and one that focused on the individual as a human being went hand in hand, but we must keep in mind that uh, everything isn't like the land of honey. There are, have been significant challenges. We have to demonstrate that people are first, irrespective of challenges or costs. On two occasions, in fact, we found that we had a surplus of staff. In one case, 1,000 salespeople. In 1980-something, we had a crazy president who did away with the exchange rate. <laughs> with the market, the banks were nationalized, market went down, and we all of a sudden found ourselves with a thousand trucks and routes which weren't selling enough and which we had to do away with. We, on another occasion, found that we had 5,000 surplus staff back in the tequila era. We found solutions to these challenges. We did not lay off uh, the employees. Of course, we took certain costs upon ourselves. In the first case, providentially, we'd been working quite a few years on plans to launch a new line of sweetbreads and tortillas, which for whatever reason hadn't moved forward. We took advantage of the crisis and the thousand salespeople and thousand trucks to launch our new line and so avoid laying off these people. What we did was to repaint the trucks with the new brand, Tia Rosa. We changed the salespeople's uniforms and we started manufacturing the products provisionally in the Bimbo and Marinela factories. It may sound easy, although it wasn't, and 
we were able to keep our staff on board and move forward positively. In the second case, during the famous tequila crisis, our uh, Arthur Doolittle consultants completed a study at the end of which I was told that there were several areas of opportunity, big problems, right? And one of those areas of opportunities was that we had 5,000 people too many. For me personally, this is one of the most significant crises that I'd faced in the company. I'm not going to enter into too much detail, but we didn't lay off these people. We stopped hiring new staff. We had to uh, lay off a manager who did hire a new person. We retrained many, many people to take over other positions. We had a 12 percent turnover rate. I thought that that would help us weather this somewhat. And one way or another, we were able to overcome that. Ultimately, a very key group of staff, young executives who'd been sent abroad to study, created work groups. And we sent them around the world to identify areas of opportunity, better practices, which ultimately resulted in improved productivity, modernization, and this whole crisis, albeit with certain costs, turned out rather well. This, of course, can't always be done. As most of you know, we recently acquired Sarah Lee operations. And now we found that there are 40 factories, many of which are very small, very old, very inefficient. And we will have to close them down. And staff will have to be laid off. We're trying to make this as painless as possible. But at times, that is the only path. What I want to get across is that companies, business people play a very important role. Their behavior truly influences the society which surrounds them. I think it's easy to understand that in a social environment where if all companies were honest, just, responsible, dynamic, respectful, had a social, the social climate surrounding it would be very similar to that. And to the contrary, in a society which allows its companies to be corrupt, to lie, to be abusive without a true sense of social awareness, well, in a similar manner, outlining, outlying societies probably suffer from, from the same ills. Peter Drucker once said that the company would be a model for the communities in which we live. If we truly reflect on this a bit, we must understand that it is the various companies which allow us to live uh, the life we live, telecommunications, radio, uh, foodstuffs, banks, constructions, etc. All of these exert tremendous influence upon the societies or communities which we find ourselves in, as well as upon its employees. That's why companies and institutions need to be ever more socially responsible, not name only, uh, but seeking to ensure a more just society. Family, schools, churches all play, albeit an ever smaller role, an important one in the makeup of its society. I say an ever smaller one because, unfortunately, we've seen now that now it's the larger media organizations which tr truly exert significant influence. That aside, though, companies still play an important role. Companies are schools. Companies do much to 
shape its pe their people. People in companies with, with a soul discover and encompass improved ideas, ideals, uh, incorporate positive values in their lives, and, and really help build a better society. Allow me to share a story which for me is truly important, although it would be, appear to be trivial. Around 1966-67, when I was manager of the Guadalajara plant, I hired a young worker who had studied through sixth grade elementary. He started as sweeping. He worked for almost 40 years at the company. And one day, the employee from Guadalajara called me and said, Don Roberto, I would like to go say hello to you. I'm retiring. He arrived at my office with his wife, and he said, I'm here to say thank you. And I said, no, it's I who should thank you. You worked at the company for 40 years. And he said, no, I'm here to thank you. I started very modestly. I was promoted to an officer, to a professor, and and I became a, uh, a professor, or rather, um, I instructed many people in um, the ovens. Now I have my own home. My five children are uh, in professional fields. They all have their academic studies. And I have some shares in the company. I have my shares and I have my uh, retirement fund. And I was able to train other people in other cities. I'm very proud. I'm very pleased. And you know what? <laughs> Even more importantly, I'm here. It's the same wife that I'm with in front of you. <laughs> you might laugh, but it's really important. Because what really was he trying to tell, us, tell me? The company. But he, you know, he's, he started very young, with very little education. He was able to um, rise in the company. I asked him about his shares. I said, what are your shares worth? And this is, you know, almost 20 years ago or so. Back then, his shares were worth $300,000. If he didn't sell them today, they're worth 600000 So, But what, what really was he trying to tell me? I have friends and colleagues who <laughs> appear with a different wife, but not here. It's the same one. He didn't really say that, but that's what he meant. Why, why, why did he refer to that, that he was still with his wife? Well, because that was part of the, the richness of the company structure that he had absorbed, the value in a company which uh, truly integrates people into it. So the company, it's, it's not really a place to generate wealth, but to serve, to serve those on the outside and serve those on the inside. The company needs to promote a healthy society. It should be a focal point of development and harmony. That is why we as business people have that very important role to play. To conclude, you know, a company with profound social awareness represents so much for those in it, for its clients, for its consumers, for our communities at large. A business people are required that understand that companies aren't merely the result of things, but are the results of the actions people take. And if that is achieved, then everything falls into place naturally. Sadly, in most countries, many uh, companies use people instead of did something? Many times, issues of social justice and respect are left aside. These employees, in addition to being frustrated, um, 
generating negative results for their companies aren't very enthusiastic nor creative. They aren't interested in the well-being of their companies, and, and they have reason for that. So from here, we see uh, shutdowns, strikes, lack of interest. Steve mentioned just a minute ago, or I, I mentioned to him rather, that the company's been around for 67 years and we haven't had any strike, but that may not necessarily be true. Let me share. 15 days ago, I was in Honduras, Tegucigalpa, in a meeting of bishops and entrepreneurs, and speaking of this subject, I said, we haven't had a strike in 67 years, with the exception of one in Honduras. The day, the day that we purchased it, there was a strike. The week following, it was successfully resolved. So that was the only strike in our 67 years. I think it's a good thing that companies today aspire to be included in the category of socially responsible companies. We know that we must satisfy n numerous requirements to be considered as such. What's important is that the company truly wish to make the commitment to promoting the common good. I, I do also want to say that in addition to everything that I mentioned uh, previously, that we as business people also are responsible for looking after our environment, the reduction of energy consumption, water optimization, alternative energies, reforestation, and everything related to preserving sustainability. I believe that with this, I will conclude my presentation. I greatly thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I hope that you may have learned a bit from my remarks. So I hope uh, all of you were as inspired by Don Roberto's comments as I was. <laughs> and uh, before I begin with the more formal prepared questions that I had, I'm just curious, when you talk about the man in the uniform who wanted to be <laughs> buried in it, and uh, <laughs> I heard the story yesterday, it brought tears to my eyes yesterday, today I got choked up by it. Where, where does this come from that you're able to see beyond the uniform into the soul, I don't think I'm exaggerating here, into the soul of the person who's working for you, and you see them as more than just un empleado, un trabajador. You see them more than just an employee or a worker. Where does this come from? Let me answer with another experience that we just had. Uh, since we acquired the American companies, where we, re we realized that uh, there is a very large group of managers, very important people, very professional people, but that do not feel these ideas. They don't, <laughs> they, they don't know exactly wh what we want to do as a uh, empresa fully humane. So, uh, we had to develop a strategy to work with these people, and we have made many plans to do it. One of the part of this strategy, we decided to invite about 60 of the top executive people to a reunion in, La, in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Antigua. In Antigua. Uh, we had a three-day, three-night reunion, speeches, uh, videos, uh, uh, tequila, mariachis, uh, <laughs> music, uh, the whole works. And they were invited with their wives. And it about uh, another group of the Mexican executives with their guides, assisted, were a bunch of people, three days, three nights. And at the end of this reunion, one lady wife of one of the, of, the, of the executives came to me and he, he, she told me, Don Roberto, may I give you a kiss? I said, yes, ma'am, <laughs> of 
course, thank you very much. I say, why? And, and you know, she told me, you know, my husband has been in this business for about 28 years. He has been changing companies, names, and so on. And this is the first time that I know what is he doing. This is the first time that they pay attention to me. <laughs> and this is the first time that I have the feeling that this is going to be the last company that, that we work on. So we are very confident, we are very happy, and we, that's why we want to give you a kid. So I, I think I answered. You know, when, when a person, let me tell, tell you something else. In this same reunion, one of the executives asked my brother Lorenzo, he said, okay, I understand what you want to do, so, but why? Why do you do it? And my brother said, you know, because we love them. We love them. So they are brothers. We love them. We want that them uh, realize themselves as persons. They are going to grow. They are going to be cooperative. They are going to be uh, happy people. That's why we, we want to do that. And we want to do that with our customers. We want our consumers. We love them. We don't want to cheat them. We don't want to charge them more than they should in prices. We are not going to, to advertise in, in, in a television that it's harming the family. So we, we love our customers. We are going to try to be nice with them. And they are going to be nice to us. No? Thank you. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and again, uh, I think many of us may be touched by your sincerity and um, the honesty that you have. And I, frankly, it's very refreshing as a faculty in the business school to hear a business leader of your stature uh, saying the things that you're saying and in the way that you're saying them. And I'm just, I'm honored to be here uh, sitting next to you, frankly. Um, but with that in mind, <laughs> um, I noticed you, um, and by the way, I need to make a couple of uh, points. Uh, first of all, uh, Don Roberto has written a book, uh, Believe and Create, Ingredients of a Successful Business Strategy, which is the English translation, is written in Spanish. So some of you may be interested in learning more about uh, what he's doing. By the way, this isn't a book tour. Uh, you know, He's not pushing the book, but I am, because if you're like me, you probably want to learn more about his philosophy and um, the philosophy that's associated uh, with him and with Grupo Bimbo. Um, as well, and I also forgot a few other brands like Boboli, Entenmann's, Marinella, which he mentioned, Tia Rosa, and Wonder Bread. And then also, um, I, I failed to mention that uh, Grupo Bimbo has a real emphasis, and I want to talk about this actually in a question, but I want to lay the groundwork with uh, letting you know that uh, Grupo Bimbo has won a number of certifications for environmental sustainability. Um, they have 31 plants in Mexico, uh, according to this um, reading here, it was reported, Mexico's clean industry, uh, 77 plants that are AIB, three plants that meet the Mexico environmental excellence, it even got two kosher plants, uh, and uh, HACCP, 70 plants, uh, environmental certification, 27 plants, and um, would you mind also talking a little bit about some of your environmental initiatives that you have? Uh, you've talked to me briefly about some of those, in particular the, the windmill farm where you apparently have, I think, 45 windmills um, that are generating enough electricity, the way I understand it, to maybe make your carbon footprint neutral in Mexico. That's it. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, in a very few days we are going to inaugurate this park. 45 towers. <laughs> uh, but, but I think that uh, we are doing much more than that, I think. Uh, we are very much uh, occupied on uh, watching for water. Water in Mexico is uh, it's difficult and it's going to be much more a problem in the future. So w we are catching rainwater in all of our factories. Uh, we are re... Recycling. Yeah, I don't know how you say it in English. Treating the water? Yeah, we have all the plants that re... re, re clean up the water and re, we reuse Recycle, it. Reuse the water, yeah. It's a very expensive uh, mm -hmm. proposition, but it, we had to do it. Uh, 
we are uh, changing many of the electrical motors that consume unnecessarily uh, an energy. This is very important, reducing the, the, the amount, but also the costs. It's, 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 it's profitable to do it. Then uh, on uh, garbage, I don't know how they did it, but they have reduced the amount of garbage in the plants. Every, every, every month we have new figures, new figures from 30 tons to 20 tons to 10 tons to 5 tons. I don't know how they do it, but they are doing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then uh, we created an institution that is named Reforestamos Mexico. Uh, this institution, wh when we started it, we, we thought it was, joint, it was going to be only a, an institution that was going to plant new trees. And of course, they are doing that by millions, but it's not only that, they are taking care of many, many forests. They have spoken with the governors of the different states, and they have even the opportunity to participate in those areas and speak with the people that, work, that live in those areas that were not taking care of them. And it, it, we have joined the Bank of America and Walmart and other companies together doing all that job in Mexico. And it is impressive the amount of, uh, of trees and greens that, that we are protecting and, and creating. This is very, very important. We have also done many things on the, uh, the contamination of the trucks. In Mexico, we operate probably more than 12,000 trucks. So it's important. In Mexico City, we were using gas instead of gasoline. Now we are changing for other reasons, but uh, it is important what you can also save and protect in these areas. Thank you. Um, some skeptics may believe that um, abiding by the social teachings of the church, and you mentioned in your talk solidarity and subsidiarity. Um, by the way, it's clear from these remarks and the example of your own life as a Christian that you believe in them and abide by them. Grupo Bimbo's motto, to be highly productive and fully human, I'm translating there, are certainly laudatory in a model for other companies. In terms of the practical reality of Grupo Bimbo, are these goals or are they reality? I mean, you're a huge company. You've got plants all over the world. Uh, it is a reality in Mexico. And it's part reality in, in South America, Central America, Central America very well. Uh, I think that uh, very easily uh, the people have absorbed our philosophy. Mm. Argentina, it's a little bit more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Brazil is much, much more difficult. Uh, and the US is very difficult. Uh, le, le, uh, China is, China is, a, is an experience. Uh, we tried to, but we, we don't have employees that stay in the company. They move you know, so quickly, they leave the company very quickly. So uh, I cannot say that we have advanced in this area. But uh, it is, it is, mm -hmm. you know, we discover that the, what the, the principles of, the, of social doctrine that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that I mentioned, uh, are the, this is the, what the, the, the pearls mm. and the hidden treasure that uh, is in the Gospels. Right. This is what the, those values are. And if you understand them mm -hmm. to the respect of the human, the dignity of the human person, right. justice, right. Uh, environmental sustainability, solidarity, solidarity, subsidiarity. No, if you really, really try to live that, this is a different one. Right. And I think even ethical treatment of workers is in there as well. So, you're, um, so it's interesting how that's actually playing out in reality. Um, some skeptics may believe that that is kind of a luxury, maybe reserved for more established companies like yours. Is it possible, do you think, for startup companies, those just getting started, to achieve the four Ps, as we like to say here, uh, USD in particular in the, in the Center for Peace and Commerce, people, planet, profit, and peace? 
Is it possible even for well, a startup? I think that I already, I already mentioned that in my, in my presentation. Of course, I think that it's the only, it is the only way, you know. Uh, I, I think, you know, every person, individually, either Chinese or Brazilian or American, or we are the same, we are the same, same persons. Yeah. And we have all the same aim, the same uh, values. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you respect them, <coughs> th these people are going to, to you know, let, let me say it the other, other way. It, it is not fair that a, a company, it's big, small, whatever, mm -hmm. hires a person just to use him as, as if it were a machine, yeah. and then when they don't need it, just throw it away. This, this is not, not human, it's mm -hmm. not moral. You know? mm -hmm. So I think that every company, even yeah. very small company, they should understand that the person is the important part. The person is important. And when, when you take care of the person, the person takes care of you and the company. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I found that uh, fascinating, your discussion about the so-called dilemma of uh, efficiency versus humane treatment of workers is actually a false dilemma, as you pointed out in your talk. Um, <clears throat> when we go to uh, Mexico, if we go, per, uh, for example, 20 miles south, we are in Tijuana, and when we see uh, the, um, how clear foreign direct investment has impacted the Mexican retail sector in particular, especially since NAFTA in 1995. You can't drive very far without seeing Walmart or McDonald's, Costco, or even Home Depot. We generally think in the U.S. of foreign direct investment going from the U.S. into Mexico. But here you are, a Mexican, Mexican company coming north, foreign direct investment into the United States. I remember as a, a very young child in the, early, in the mid 80s, when I was hired out of, uh, grad, out of uh, my undergraduate program at Hallmark, we had just in time, and that was really big at that time. And just in time, and TQM, and these buzzwords came from the Japanese foreign direct investment in the United States. These are things we in the U.S. learned from Japanese companies coming to the U.S. to teach us about just in time delivery manufacturing processes. We even used words like kanban, which are Japanese words. And it's fascinating to me to think about a Mexican company coming to the U.S. What can we, do you think? What can companies in the U.S. Learn from Mexican companies like Pan or Grupo Bimbo that come to the U.S. What are the things that you think American companies will learn? What is our kanban that you think we will learn? Well, let, let me tell you this. A uh, few years ago, uh, the Harvard University Business School uh, made a case of Bimbo, and of course, when they presented the case, they asked some of the top executives sometimes myself, sometimes other people, to come to the class after the presentation and then do some questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And during one of those uh, presentations, at the end, one of the students asked me, uh, not, not with very good voice, says, why, why you Mexicans? What do you think that you can do in the United States? What you can bring into the United States? And uh, uh, my answer was, you know, in, in the matter of technology, we cannot bring anything. This is, everybody knows, everybody goes to the fairs all over the world. We know the machinery. If you ask me about uh, the uh, technical, well, we send our people to study at, in the United States. Everybody can do that. We don't have any hidden formulas. Uh, if you ask me about marketing, marketing, everybody knows marketing. So we don't have anything about those things that we can bring here. But I think that we can bring something in the area of uh, human values. Human, and I think this is so important that uh, it makes us, uh, gives us a profound satisfaction to, to see that we can bring something that is very valuable. And this is the this uh, human yeah. human values. Okay. And some of those you've already spoken about yeah. today: the treatment of the environment and treatment of workers. I assume uh, mostly mm -hmm. the respect, the treatment to the human person, okay. customers, suppliers, 
suppliers. We want to do a win-win relation. We don't want to, to squeeze the, right. <laughs> the customers. We don't want, I mean, the consumers, we don't want to lie to them. Yeah. There are many products that lie, that cheat, that we don't. We try. So if, we, if you love the people, then you are doing something good. And at the beginning, sooner or later, this is going to show. Great. Well, I'm afraid that we are out of time. And we, we do have a small uh, presentation that we would like to make. So Denise Diamond from the Allers Center for National Business and the Interna Undergraduate International <laughs> thing. Oh, thank you very On much. On behalf of the uh, University of San Diego community, just a small token of our appreciation, and especially for all of the young people here to be such an inspiring business leader <laughs> that uh, we can all know that we can be successful and also really care about those around us in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Marzano. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.